who might be with you. Okay, Shira Felberbaum, <laughs> get him, continue <laughs> once again. <laughs> Caring for people living with both dementia and Holocaust related trauma. Okay, so it's January 29th, 2024, and we're moving forward, but I just want to acknowledge my colleague. Uh, and friend, Adina Siegel, who with whom I had the pleasure of putting together uh, much of this content and who is a real mentor and a contributor to the to the content. And I want to say thanks again. Okay, so we're going to uh, get going here. And uh, like I said, just uh, really invite you all to hold some comments and questions and make sure that we get to them. So the agenda for tonight is really to look at how Caring Kind can partner with you in navigating and managing this journey. And you'll hear me say later on that this is really not the kind of journey that somebody wants to travel on their own. Uh, it can be incredibly isolating, as you all know, and it's challenging, especially in these days and times. We want to look and understand the significance of Holocaust Remembrance Day and the events of recent times and how those sort of um, interplay with the two, right? Because you have challenges from the past, but then we're also living through a challenging period in time right now. And those two are also conflated. So you've got lots of variables to deal with. We wanna look at the role of memory in our lives and specifically in the Jewish experience. We wanna talk about some mixed blessings. We'll, we'll pause for a moment of silence and it will be an opportunity for us to actually practice some of the things that we believe are important to do as caregivers and care partners. And then we'll focus on the self-care and the importance of the caregiver journey and some tools that might be helpful. And then we'll switch over to looking at the experience of the person living with dementia. And then we'll wrap up with my content uh, by looking at a specific example where we sort of apply this to some real experiences and particularly looking at those things that we know tend to be the most challenging or stressful for care partners. And then, you know, we'll really open it up for questions, thoughts, comments, and we'll we'll take it from there and think about maybe some next steps. And, you know, if you guys have examples of things you want us to talk through, by all means, please bring them to the table. Um, so just pretty quickly, I want to take you through a caring kind. Some of you may have been working with us for decades, right? Because we've been around a long time. And others of you may be entirely new to caring kind, or maybe you worked with us decades ago uh, and our programs and services have really grown. So I just want to take a moment to connect you, to make sure you're aware of this and uh, to know that you should not go through this journey alone. It's really too challenging to do that. And, and we really want to serve as a trusted partner. So here, here are some ways in which we could potentially provide support. So first of all, we have family supports and educations. This is one of many educational seminars, right? Uh, we have educational seminars that deal with legal and finance and Medicaid home care and, you know, transitions and all kinds of important things. We have the basics of just understanding what dementia is and what it's not and the different types and the stages. And then we have programs that are kind of more um, group oriented, cohort based, where we come together and have some education and get some emotional support. And then we have straight up what we call support groups and we get broken up into uh, support groups, perhaps by uh, relationship, like these individuals are all care partners who are parents or, or adult children to parents, or these are all care partners who were, who were um, spouses or partners. And so we, we try to uh, put like people in similar situations together. We also offer some uh, consultations through the helpline. And then, you know, at the end of the journey, there are bereavement support groups, because I think that so much of our of our uh, identity gets wrapped up in being a care partner, whether as a professional or as a, a family member. And so it's really important that we give ourselves the space to deal with all that at the end. Uh, we, we have some programs that are really powerful that are also available that are focused on the experience of uh, the people living with dementia. And just before I move on, I just want to mention that we also do coaching, caregiver coaching, which is also really important. So we can work on people one-on-one. -on -one. In the early stage realm, uh, we have programs that are designed to help stimulate the brain. We refer to that as cognitive stimulation therapy. And then we have some really innovative programs that are kind of a combination of education and emotional support called Journey Together. And then an opportunity for people to write a script and voice out uh, in a theater style performance, their experience and to whom I may concern, like what do I as a person living with dementia want people in the world to know about me that's more than just my dementia. And that also really helps to, de to take away some of the stigmatization. So it's a very powerful thing where we get to hear people's voices, especially people who've been silenced. Uh, and then there are some stakeholder engagement opportunities and make it matter. These other programs are all equally important. They just fall in different areas. I think I'll just highlight very briefly some of the social and community engagement opportunities. So we really value the role that art plays and that can be museum-based art, it can be symphonies. And those are experiences that can be shared together through a dyad, through connect to culture. And we started recently something new called baseball reminiscence, right? People of different interests. Not everyone's an art buff, so some people like uh, sports. So, so we've got this thing going on with baseball. 
And then we have a program where we can be peered called Memory Advocates, where we can be peered with um, a former caregiver, someone who was in a caregiving role, like many of us, but are no longer caregivers because they've experienced a loss. And we encourage them to go through some training with us and, and to join that. Um, and of course, you know, we try to prevent wandering. We never know when someone will wander. So we try to prevent that by encouraging people to sign up uh, for Medic Alert and we walk them through the process should there be a missing episode and we try to attend to their needs and, and walk them through hopefully to a safe return. Uh, so th other things happening behind the scenes, but those are all important to know about. So think about us um, in any of those contexts. So tonight is really focused on the discussion of prominent caregiving challenges and effective care partner strategies. We're going to be looking at the unique aspects, as I mentioned, of that intersection between dementia and Holocaust-related trauma. And we need to do this in the context of understanding uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day. And some of you may know that we've had Holocaust Remembrance programs in the past. And I think looking at what makes this year different and perhaps more challenging is really important because these unique events, which I'm sure are all over the news and are no um, surprise to anyone at this point, uh, there's been a lot that's gone on since October 7th with that massacre and the uh, captives that were taken, the hostages, the innocent civilians that were taken, and of course, the ongoing war. And so the media is just filled with images, and we really want to uh, be sensitive to that and recognize that this Holocaust Remembrance Day takes on a different meaning in that context. Um, not to say that context doesn't matter, but, you know, it just, it amplifies the point that this is relevant. It's not just something from our history. It's also something in our presence. And some of you may have had the opportunity to participate in the program that Dina and Siegel and I worked on together that was specifically for the response to us, you know, being Israel at war and being responsive caregiver during difficult times. And that happened, uh, you know, just back in November. And this is really standalone, but it can easily build off of the other. So, you know, we've come away since then and there's new things going on. So it's just nice to mention that that uh, we're still thinking about how to respond and be responsive to the emerging needs. So let's just talk for a brief moment about commemorating the Holocaust Remembrance Day. So I just threw out some questions, right? Like what is International Holocaust Remembrance Day? Um, a lot of people perhaps are more familiar with Yom HaShoah. Uh, some people focus more on Holocaust Remembrance Day, the International Day. Uh, but irrespective, like why is this day of significance and what's important to this? So we'll, we'll try to unpack some of that in a moment. How is this uh, 2024 year uh, different? And I think I've elaborated on that already, already right? You imagine... Um, the horrors of being, God forbid, asleep in, in your own home and, you know, being taken out and forcibly or, you know, being dancing, celebrating for this beautiful holiday of Simchat Torah, where you're celebrating the joy of having received the Torah. And, you know, you're waking up to go to shul to pray, you know, just, it's just so unimaginable. And yet people are really living through this. So I think the, the here and now, we, we always say to people, stay present, you know, stay in the moment. The problem is the moment's not so good either, right? Like, so that's kind of tricky. So we want to talk a little bit about that. And then looking at the role that social media has, right? Because social media is pretty powerful and can be used for good, uh, but sometimes it's not used uh, as effectively as we'd like, right? It's, we've seen people um, propagate misinformation and disseminate misinformation, you know, about these atrocities in a very profound way. And we know this is very different than, let's say, for the Holocaust period where this there was propaganda for sure, uh, but it's not to the same extent, right? We have whole groups of people who are, who are engaged now of all ages, particularly the younger generations, who are really committed to a cause which they may or may not fully understand because they might be basing their belief system on some false prejudices. Um, then we want to look at the like the role of culture, like how are things changing? What was the culture like uh, back in the Holocaust days? What is it like now? I think there's some shifts in sort of what we focus on. I think there's a, a big commitment to looking at oppressed versus the oppressor, victimhood, and who's got responsibility. So there's sort of a a, a air of a context in which we're looking at the world, how we're filtering the information we get. And then I think particularly difficult for a lot of people might have been the um, abundance of attention paid to the Me Too movement, which just to refresh everyone's memory, was this movement that said, you know, it's not okay to take advantage of of women primarily, although it could have also happen to men, right? And the people's bodies, you know, should not be taken advantage of. There's no, um, God forbid, sexual inappropriateness and, and rape, and we don't uh, exchange power for, for these kinds of things. And it's become a tool of of um, crime in, in in sort of the ongoing war. And it's, I think, been very hard to feel perhaps like, you know, how come these lives don't matter too, these, these, these individuals' lives? 
Um, so we want to also think about the impact of large scale protests. Let's say you've been really good about minimizing your amount of social media intake. You've gone out of your way to say, um, this requires so much um, discipline, but I'm going to limit the amount of time as a caregiver that I'm going to allow myself. And by the way, the person living with dementia who I'm caring for, or the multiple people, I've limited the amount of time we're going to look at these things. And I'm only allowing myself to see a little bit. But what about just being out in the streets? It seems like most of the world has kind of taken to protesting the response. And so you really can't like escape the fact that it's all around, right? And then certainly if you look at any reports, we've seen that there's been this just tremendous surge in reported, never mind unreported, uh, reported anti-Semitic events since October 7th. So putting all of this together, I think it's pretty evident that we have a lot in our hands, right? We have a, a lot to, to deal with. There are a lot of strong emotions that get evoked through this conversation, and we want to be attentive to that. Okay, so I just move this for one second. Um, okay, I want it all. Nice to see everyone's faces. Okay. Okay, so what's the role of memory in the life of a Jewish person. I'm putting this out here. People can you know, argue, debate, but I'm just putting out here food for thought. Um, one might say uh, that Jewish history is long, spanning millennium, right? The religion spans, we say 57, 83 years, 5,783 years. And over that duration, over that time period, there have been some very significant patterns that have emerged. And we believe that those patterns have to be examined, right? What's the, the thought process? The thought process is that Jewish survival depends on learning from the past and it informs our future. Um, and it, it ties our future to the, you know, it ties our past to our future. Like we, we learn from this experience and it shapes how we live in the world. And that Judaism places paramount importance on a whole bunch of things, including studying lived experience, not just like what the texts say, also retelling our story. All you have to do is look at things like Passover and the Haggadah, right? The Seder we we go through, you know, we should experience as though we are leaving Egypt ourselves. Um, and uh, certainly, you know, retelling the stories of our sacred texts, we place a tremendous value on learning, uh, Torah observance, and not just learning and understanding, but learning with the ability to give over something by heart is like placed on such a high regard. And so when we know that this is a culture that values memory, that prides itself in being, you know, um, people of the book, right? We, we consider Judaism to be filled with people who study and learn, you can see how so much of this is placing emphasis on the cognition, on the intellectual ability, on one's ability to give over. And of course, we talk about Lador Vador, that we should transmit from generation to generation what we have learned. So with all of this in mind, you know, we know that unfortunately, some of the themes that have emerged in some of the holidays is this idea that and people say this kind of like in a perhaps a more superficial way, but this idea like, okay, they tried to kill us, they failed, we survived, let's eat, right? That's kind of like almost every, a lot of holidays, not all, but a lot of holidays have that kind of underlying, you know, theme. And so that's a theme of resilience. And we certainly want to focus on that and share that, but it also tells us of times that are hard. And, and we also talk about how anti-Semitism is not unique to a specific generation. In fact, we go so far as to say it will rise up, it will rear its ugly head in every generation. And, and you can look to history and see many, unfortunately, way too many examples of pogroms and all different kinds of, 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 of challenging times, massacres, Holocaust, or just an unrelenting number of examples. And so on the one hand, right, we have this amazing history of resilience that says we're still here. And we're still managing, we're still managing to foot forward, one foot forward in spite of how difficult things are. And think about the unity that has come about. If anyone is familiar, for instance, and what was going on in Israel prior to uh, October 7th, there was a lot of disunity. There was a lot of people having different beliefs and thoughts around how the government should be run and what the policies and procedures should be. And now, like you have a an outside group of people who are uh, potentially trying to annihilate you, and all of a sudden, everyone comes together. You put your differences aside and you come together, right? And it's like very clear, like we have to survive. Um, so there is tremendous resilience, but there's a history of loss. So why is this so incredibly important to think about? We're going to give you a little bit more to think about. We're going to frame this in the context of mixed blessings. 
So um, aging happens to be, if those of you don't know, like there are many different reasons why someone might develop dementia. And some types of dementia you learn are reversible and they're different types and they're different stages. But the one thing that we know other than like, you know, healthy habits in terms of eating healthy foods, we say a Mediterranean diet's pretty good and having a certain amount of exercise and sleeping well and you know, engaging in things that are stimulating and being socially engaged in particular. Um, is that the very aspect, the, the fact that someone ages is the single largest risk that someone will develop dementia. And so if you look at the Holocaust survivor population, by definition, as this um, article referred to from the Associated Press, that there are about 245,000 Jewish survivors still alive today. And that means they're all 80 plus, right? And so we're dealing with a subset of people who are not just older adults, but older adults who are particularly older adults, right? We talk about older adults like 65 and older, 60 and older. We're talking about the older, older adults, right? And these are individuals who have a history of trauma. And so Holocaust survivors are then almost by definition disproportionately prone to developing dementia, not just because of the trauma and everything else, but just by virtue of their age. If you just look at the age factor, they're like at a higher, like that, okay. And then it's, you can't talk about, I don't think the Holocaust experience without talking about sort of uh, subsequent generations, we sort of refer to them as second and third generation survivors who have internalized and ex experienced indirectly, if you will, this intergenerational vicarious trauma. And by this, we mean that if you have lived in a household um, where maybe there is discussion of of losses and, and the people who you know didn't make it through the concentration camps, or you live in a household where your parents did not have role models because their parents are deceased, um, taken away from this, or there's just an era of just heightened um, hypervigilance and some of the other things that go with being a survivor of such intense trauma. Um, it just, it seeps into your experience of how you look at the world. It impacts a lot of things, right? It impacts your worldview. It impacts your uh, ability to develop coping skills and what coping skills you choose to develop. And it, it helps to cultivate tremendous resilience, um, but still leaving challenges to work through at later parts in life. Um, so I think just a quick example that comes to mind here is that if somebody is a, a survivor of uh, the Holocaust or is the next generation, you could imagine, um, as Adina pointed out so aptly, that you don't want to really show vulnerability because if you could imagine back in the time when you're being sentenced to march and you're in a death camp, if you can't continue marching and you can't continue working, you probably aren't still here, right? Because there was no, you know, there was deemed not to be value and, and those people were, their lives were ended. And so the ability to demonstrate vulnerability might not be so intuitive. It might in fact be counterintuitive. It almost feels like it's counter to one's ability to survive. If I let you know that I need help, if I let you know I'm struggling, what does that mean? Am I going to be more apt to um, to not make it in this world? Like who can I really trust? So there are all these important things to be thinking about. And we know uh, that people who live with trauma often have like flashbacks, periods where they think back or remember back and they feel like they're in the moment, that they're reliving the experience. And we know that this can be due to any of the five senses, right? It could be something that someone hears, a certain sound, a siren. It could be something that someone smells. Uh, I think there was reference to like those very strong chemicals that got used to clean um, the, the bath houses that were used as gas chambers. Um, there are all these different types of things that are like they just, they're like etched into your being. They're so strong. It's its something somatic. You just experience and you feel like you're back in that spot. And so how much more so that literally continuously since October 7th, people have been bombarded, right? Um, with worry and concern based upon what they heard happened on October 7th and subsequently. Um, just said anti-Semitic spikes, the, the losses of life, the ongoing war, you know, don't need to elaborate, but it's just, it's in the air. It's its its just so present. It doesn't feel like it's something we're just dealing with in the past. It's in the now. So let me see one thing if I just want to see one. Okay. So um, power of silence. I think it's really important just to acknowledge um, that the same way we feel compelled, right, to celebrate positive things, holidays that happen in Judaism and, and to celebrate, we also feel 
uh, compelled to acknowledge, to commemorate, to honor, to remember, to reflect on all the people who have perished before us, right? We 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 stand in a long line of people who came before us, a lot of generations between now and all those thousands of years before. And we, we want to feel that we are able to connect to those people. So in a moment, I'm going to invite us to actively commemorate um, those individuals. But before I do that, I just want to say also that the people who made it out of that experience, those those profound experience and survived um, are bearing witness, right? They are our link to the past, past to the future. They are the individuals who we feel like we want to honor and respect and care for in a dignified manner, right? We feel it's an obligation. It's not just something that's nice to do, it's an obligation. And we wanna do our very best to maintain each person's sense of personhood. And what do I mean by that? I think the experience of being in the Holocaust was a very dehumanizing experience, right? You need to look no further than someone's numbers on their arms to know to be reduced to a number is the antithesis of honoring someone in their full personhood, right? So we we really want to make sure that when we think about dementia and the connection to caring for someone in the Holocaust, that we are really being sensitive to this aspect of personhood, like we would want to be anyone, right? But puts all the more so, right? Because we're like trying to make up for lost time. We want to make sure this person feels whole to the extent that they can. And we also know that in, in Jewish religion, there's a real commitment, you know, the, the Ten Commandments, there's the kibbutz aim that we should honor our parents. And this is taken seriously, right? In some 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 streams of Judaism, there's, there's a real commitment um, to be respectful and to honor individuals. But I think it's important to highlight that this is the thing that I think is the most obvious and yet the least focused on, that in order for us to be able to successfully show up in our people's lives, the people who are in fact living with dementia and our Holocaust survivors, the only way we can do that is if we first take care of ourselves, right? If we are not caring for ourselves, it is really hard to show up in a way um, that brings out our best self. It just, it's hard, right? And so we have to also honor the fact that as second and third generation um, caregivers ourselves or possibly survivors or care partners, somehow who are connected in the field and the world, that we have to turn internally, right? And we have to we have to make sure that we're in touch with how we feel and, and what we need to do to move forward, right? Because we, as these the subsequent generation, have been impacted through the stories we've heard um, about growing up during wartime. And we, we need to make sure that we can pause and take care of ourselves. So I'm gonna offer just a brief moment of silence as an opportunity for us to both engage in a little self-care and to reflect and honor the memories of others. And if you want during this time to do deep breathing or a progressive muscle relaxation or a site of psalm, whatever kind of speaks to you, find your way and just take a moment, if you will, okay? It was probably I'm guessing about 30 seconds, um, but hopefully it was just a chance for us to pause and sort of acknowledge the people in our lives who we want to honor and uh, check in with ourselves. So we're going to start talking in a moment about sort of the caregiver journey and some things to be mindful of. And we'll, we'll, we'll then later on move into the journey of the person living with dementia. But as we make this transition, I just want to acknowledge that Everything we just did felt heavy. I felt heavy saying it, and I imagine that it's heavy to experience it. And I didn't do that um, lightly. Like I did that with intention so that we can be aware of what's going on in our bodies. And now we're going to actually apply some of the principles we talk about. So here we are looking at the caregiver journey. So we talk about the importance of checking in with ourselves. And this, again, seems pretty obvious. Of course, I check in with myself. What do you mean? Okay. Okay. But it really needs to be something we we do prior to interacting uh, with with the person living with dementia. Because um, if we notice that there's tightness in our chest, our heart's racing, we're feeling pain, uh, anything's going on that feels different, that makes us feel out of sorts, 
it's going to influence how we engage with the people living with dementia. And so there's this nice acronym, and I'll give a, a call out not only to Adina here, but also to the folks over at OHEL from Zachter uh, Trauma Center, because you know, they identified this, this important acronym HALTS, right? And it's just a nice way to remember that some of the areas you might want to be attuned to are the ideas of if you're hungry, if you're angry, if you're lonely, if you're tired, sick, or stressed. And I feel like with what's going on in the world feels a little upside down. Uh, it's easy to be in that space. Um, technology is a blessing. We can be connected, but we're connected 24-7. It's kind of like nonstop. It's hard to turn it off other than maybe if you observe Shabbat, right? And you just kind of like pause, which is the biggest gift. Just a little plug. Um, no, really. So you, so there's a sense of just being generally run down. And then you've got this hypervigilance with what's going on. You can go a little further, right? You can consider what you're feeling emotionally, right? How is this impacting your caregiving? Like, are you more angry than usual, less patient, more prone to yelling? How might how you're feeling influence your interaction? How might it play out? Could you envision how if you gave yourself a few extra minutes to do something and weren't rushing, um, how you might have a different interaction, right? Because interacting with people with dementia, right, we have to go more slowly. We have to kind of realize if we speak too quickly, it may not be understood, we may have to repeat ourselves multiple times. And we need to be able to realize that after a while, if you're human, repeating something multiple times is going to get frustrating. So we got to take the extra deep breath and pause. And it's really great to know these things and then being able to do them. That's a whole other level, right? That's something to work towards. Right? In, our meadowed, in our character development, we can work towards that. But just being aware of this is big, right? So do you feel numb, disconnected? Are you having troubles concentrating? Perhaps you're a little more absent-minded? Is anxiety getting the best of you? Or are you being hypervigilant? I mean, right now there's real threat, right? There's real threat. There are active protests going on. Um, there are people, there are some protests that become violent. There is a real fear. There are heightened security threats throughout the Jewish community and schools and synagogues and Jewish community centers and day schools. I mean, it's real, right? And then it's like anywhere you are, just on the street. But how, how, how do you keep that in check, right? So that it doesn't take over everything. And maybe if you just come in from outside and you've just had an interaction that was particularly triggering, what are we able to do to center or to ground ourselves before we interact with the person living with dementia? Those are like small ways we can shift that. And for some of you, you might be difficult having difficulty experiencing even more so than usual, falling asleep, staying asleep, and just feeling like really um, short-tempered because you're sleep deprived. It's a very real thing. So what else is, did we just do? Well, our moment of silence didn't just give us an opportunity to check in with ourselves generally. It also modeled for us how to put our oxygen mask on ourselves, right? We all know if you take a plane, the, the steward or stewardess is going to say, put that oxygen mask on yourself before you help someone who's in distress who needs it to. First, take care of yourself because, you know, it's not always so intuitive, right? You're like, I have a minor sitting next to me or I have an older adult next to me. I want to take care of them. But if, if you've passed out, right, you're not of any good to anyone else. And we really want to avoid caregiver burnout. So this is the idea of really attending to ourselves first, just like we talked about in our feeling states, and then doing something about it. So the first step would be like that acknowledgement. Okay, something is different in here that's not, I know this is not going to be effective for me. I'm going to pause. And the second is really dealing with that dysregulation and taking active steps to become less agitated, to become less frustrated, to become more centered. And what did we just do? I invited you to take a moment of silence. And I want to credit also Ed Shaw, who came here and did a brilliant training for us on one of the programs that we have called Partner Together and Journey Together, which is kind of like a, a cohort-based psychological impactful training and support group. Um, and he talked about the power of silence, that sometimes we don't take that moment enough, like we're in such a rush to go. And I think we can see that even in the 30, 60 seconds, whatever it might have been, that Hopefully we feel a little bit more calm and that really there's no right way or wrong way. It's like experimenting and finding what works for you. You know, if you know that you're someone who wants to do yoga, great. If you know that you're someone who wants to have a mantra and say the meditation or give a positive affirmation, you know, I will get through this. I've been through this before. Or this is just one of those moments, you know, whatever works for you, but it's really about experimenting until you find a couple of trusted, you know, things that you can go to and then mindfulness, Right. Uh, I think there are so many things that happen throughout the day that we sort of take for granted. Like some people say, I need my coffee, right? So what is it about the coffee that you need? And if you sit there with the coffee for the first few sips, the first two or three sips and just setting, by the way, it could be tea um, or anything else, a cup of water. You know, what are the things about that that are so soothing? If I take a sip of water, let's say, it's cold, it's refreshing, pauses me to stop. It pauses, slows me down. 
you know, what about that? Maybe for some of you, the coffee, it's the smell of the coffee beans roasting, or it's the taste of that favorite flavor you have. But really just figuring out how to check in with ourselves. It could be washing the dishes, right? As you wash the dishes and it can kind of become like a, a meditation or folding laundry. Like we could find what speaks to us um, individually where we know that we're still doing what we need to do, but we can also do it mindfully. So it's not, it doesn't have to be something entirely separate and apart from what we already do. It could just be baked into what we're already doing. And we should be listening to our body, right? So you might notice by now that um, some of the common responses to traumatic events might be things that you have felt or that I generated in another discussion just temporarily. Um, you know, like we talked about the fearness, the numbness, the anger, the guilt, Lots of hope. Like, are we going to be at this again? What happened to never again? We said never again, and here we are. Um, so loss of hope. How do we rebuild confidence in our ability to deal? How do we concentrate when this is on our mind and we're supposed to be doing something else? Are we extra jumpy? And then again, listening to our body. What are we feeling? Stomach unease, as I was feeling earlier today. Is it the sleeplessness? Oh, I was up all night. Is it the headache? My head is bounding. I can't think of anything. No. Is it the heart beating very quickly? Are we perspiring? worsening mental pro problems. We just really want to be in tune. You want to think about fear and grief. Um, why did I highlight fear and grief? Well, I think when we live with someone, and here I'm going to focus more on the person with dementia that we're caring for and less about sort of the Holocaust component, but it's very hard to watch someone we love gradually change and change in a way that we know that each day we've had has probably been their best day, right? Because it's a progressive disease. And with any progressive disease, until there's a cure, we know that there is comfort care and there's engaging in meaningful activities and socializing and uh, stimulation of the brain, but there's not the ability to somehow make it better. So when we notice that today the person knows who we are and is able to cut their own food and um, travel independently, but then several months later they can't cut their own food and maybe they've gotten had a wandering incident or maybe they're forgetting who who people are in their lives, like it's very hard and accepting that and you know is just hard to do. It, it represents a tremendous sense of loss, and so kind of acknowledging that this is a little bit of a new normal. And we just have to find new ways to connect with our person who's living with dementia because we can still have meaningful relationship. It's just not going to look the same. And we have to change our expectations because if our expectations stay the same, we're going to be disappointed. And also there's a lot of uncertainty. When will the person wander? Will they ever wander? You know, will this be that day? Will they still remember me? Will they not remember me? Is this going to be one of those is everything going to go okay when we go to synagogue together? Or is this going to be like a meltdown? We're going to have like a family gathering. Is that going to go smoothly? Or, you know, is my person going to say things that are going to make other people uncomfortable? Should I let other people know? Should I not? There are all these like questions that get generated. And there's no one right answer for everyone, right? So I think one of the nice things about Care and Kind is while we're able to provide a lot of general information, we also have the ability to really tailor our content and to work with each individual family, like through dementia care consultations, uh, which is the REACH program uh, over over time or just individual consultations, we have the ability to really hear where you're at and work with you. And I think it's really important to know that what works at one point in time will work for a period of time, but we have to have other tools in our toolkit, right? Because it's going to change over time. So just accepting that not everything is in our control can be tricky. I think for people who are particularly religious, it's maybe easier to kind of say like, uh, whether you're in a 12-step program or really have a deep belief in God or Hashem, like there's an easy way to say, you know, there's a there's a higher power. It's not all on me. I just have to do my best. I just have to do my best. But sometimes it can be really hard. To, like we think our success or our failure is 100% on us and there's no other variables. But of course, there's so many other variables that have an influence and giving ourselves a little bit, you know, as people have said, as grace, right? Giving ourselves a chance to do the best we can and that noting that the next interaction, there's always an opportunity to do better right? We'll learn from each interaction. We may not be perfect all the time, but we just have to do the best we can. Uh, so I like to think about the serenity prayer here. Now, some of you might be familiar with that. And I think the essence of it is really to distinguish between those things that we have to accept um, and then to accept them because we can't change them. And then to appreciate that there are a lot of things that are still within our control and that for those things that are in our control, we need to take active steps, right? So if we think about the dementia journey, we know the person living with dementia whether we all think so or not, is doing the very best they can. They're not being mean. Um, they're not asking us to repeat the same question a hundred times because they love the sound of our voice, right? They they genuinely, for them, it's like their first time. 
and the answers we've given them, it's like for the first time. And if they're shadowing us or if they're 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 engaging with us in a way that feels disruptive, they're trying to communicate something to us. We may not understand it, but it represents an unmet need. And so we need to do our best to change um, how we interact with them. So needless to say, a lot of ambiguous loss, right? It, it shows up even present day, if you want to combine dementia to what's going on in the world. We've got all these hostages, all these civilians, men, women, children, sick. We even have Holocaust survivors, right? Like literally from babies who just turned one in captivity, to Holocaust survivors who we don't know what's going to be. We just pray for them, for their safe return and their healthy return and for the safety of everyone impacted and who's been displaced on both sides of the equation. We just return for everyone's safety. But living with such ambiguity is hard. And the same way we're dealing with this, right? The question's going to be raised about just how much is it that your people living with dementia know about what's going on in the world at large. Just to kind of summarize before I move on um, out of the space of effective, um, you know, out of the space looking at the caregiver experience. So I think that these are kind of like the key takeaways if I if I were to summarize. Effective care partner strategies. We have to check in with ourselves, right? We have to be self-aware. And then if we notice that we're out of check, right? It's not a free pass, unfortunately. Right? Then, then we have to do something about it. Then we have to kind of self-regulate. Uh, we need to recognize that we have the ability to change. And so if we don't take this step, we're going to end up in the same dynamic. We also know that <clears throat> it's possible that we might just not have the bandwidth in that moment to deal effectively with the people we're caring for. And it's important to know that and step away. You know, we used to say, you know, count 10 seconds or whatever it might be to you regroup, step away from the situation, take two minutes in the bathroom and say, I just need to go to the ladies room. I need to go to the men's room. I need, I need some little me time just to regroup, you know, put ice cubes on your forehead, your, on your, on your um, palms, do whatever you need to regulate, however that might look for you. And then step back in. It'll, it'll be better for you and it'll be better for the person you're caring for. Um, it's really critical to make sure that you don't try to take this all on on your own. I think it's very human to like want to have some degree of control and to have things done the way that you see fit, that you, what you think is best or what I think is best. But that can kind of set us up for caregiver burnout, which does not serve us very well and certainly does not serve the person we're supposed to be caring for very well. And so we have to kind of challenge some of the ways that we've been doing things and see what are things you want to hold on to and what are the things that maybe we can let go of, either our expectations, like does this really need to be done this way? Is this a danger to ourselves or them if it's not done this way? Or is this more of a so what? Like, okay, like I can get used to it. It's not the way I remember them, but I could understand that we're at a new point in the journey and this is normal for them and it's really okay. Or just saying it is important, but I don't have the bandwidth to be able to do it all. I'm sandwich generation. I'm not sandwich generation. I'm working and I'm caring for. I've got my own health problems. Whatever the reasons might be, there might be a zillion valid reasons. I'm long distance. Whatever it might be that prevents you from being all things to your person, right? It, you have to have some life for you, right? Very important. So figuring out who else you can reach out to, to broaden your circle or to, to provide more scaffolding in your caregiving system is so incredibly important. And sometimes people have to kind of like hit a bottom space before they realize, ah, I, I think I need to reach out for help. And so this is like that moment of encouragement that you might seek out one new person you haven't spoken to already, or be more specific with them about what it actually is that they could do um, that would really make a big difference for you in your ability to provide help. And always give the person the out, but like the more specific we can be, the more they can really help, right? And so who are the people you can go to? Let's think about this for a moment. Uh, in order to avoid being overwhelmed and to avoid this burnout, we can think about the people in our lives, right? There are the individuals in the broader community, perhaps you're involved in a synagogue, you're involved in a shul, some kind of faith-based community, and you have your own little network of people or, or, you know, maybe there is an advisor, a spiritual leader, someone who you trust, um, who's not even in your direct community, but it's like the go-to person you go to to ask questions, contacting them, um, contacting friends, family. You'd be surprised. We, we have this thing called share the care. It's a very famous model used to try to extend your support group. Your, your virtual support group, your, your ability to have more hands involved in care. And you could think about what what's something that a long distance person could do that a person locally doesn't need to do? What's something that the person with really good financial wherewithal and management skills can do that a person who's more sensitive and more empathic 
um, might be better off at some other task. You know, who can pop in because they're a neighbor and they're kind of nearby? Like, how do you create, to, how do you rally that? You know, are there Bikor Holim or, you know, programs of visiting the sick they're in bed in your community? And I think so much of this goes to kind of overcoming the stigma, the fear we have of letting people know that our loved one is experiencing dementia uh, and working through that, right? There's so many things that used to have tremendous, tremendous stigma and they kind of chop, you know, from generation to generation, they change. Is it mental health? Is it neurological things that are progressive? Is it about financial well-being and, you know, financial dependence and need? And what are the things that we we hold um, to be private? And when does us holding it private actually prevent us from getting the help we need? So I offer that as something to think about. And then if you put all that aside, there are organizations like Caring Kinds here um, where we're bound by confidentiality and we are here to help and there's no judgment. We really try hard to just figure out the best way to connect you or to offer resources, programs, and services ourselves that can make the journey a little bit easier for you. And I think just in general, being able to find things that are empowering makes a huge difference. I think it's very easy to feel isolated and to feel like things are happening to us. So, you know, again, going back to what we can and can't control you know, just with what's going on in the world right now, if you feel like you can give to a certain organization that is living out your values, whether it's in the dementia space or in the Jewish world and whatnot, um, if there's, you know, we've called it tzedakah, you're giving a certain amount of money, tithing. If, if there's a, a meaningful prayer that you want to say, some people recite to Hillam, like guess Psalms, and, and that's they either do it as an individual or come together as a community. If that's meaningful, go do that. If you want to write a letter to Congress or to other government officials, or you want to sit down and you know write to editorials to the people who write these articles that get published and say these these articles are not representing the full picture, or you know whatever you can do to either highlight the good or to downplay, you know hold people accountable for the things that don't seem to be doing justice are all really valuable. If you want to go show up at a rally, I think it's just a matter of finding out what's meaningful for you, right? And and that sense of shifting from it's happening to me to being able to do something proactively, even if it's small really can make a huge difference. And so I encourage you to go out and find out what that one thing is. Let's say I encourage you to find one person to talk to that maybe you haven't spoken to and asking like a specific request, maybe going and finding one thing that's new that you can feel that you can do that proactively contributes um, to your well-being. And I would just also say like, we do have some choice over who we spend our time with, right? And how we spend our time, not full, certainly as a care partner, but if you're noticing that you're you're surrounded by a lot of negativity, either in activities you're engaged in or the people, you know, you want someone speaking a lot of Lashon Hara, they're speaking words about other people you don't want to be part of, okay, remove yourself, you know? So just finding ways to, to put yourself in healthier situations because it does influence our mood and how we feel about things. Um, I recently joined a WhatsApp group and I'm not plugging this particular group um, but it's just the concept, and I'll just mention the name so you understand. Uh, it's called Israel Good News Group. And so for every thousand things I see <laughs> that break my heart, um, I, I read or let's watch a video or look at a, a few pictures or images on something and read a, a few sentences and listen to some people singing a song, and it really is uplifting. So I just encourage you to find whatever that is for you. Okay. Uh, we'll come back to the question of to tell or not to tell, because I think that might come up in the Q&A. But that, you know, not everyone has taken the... Uh, perspective that it's important to tell the person living with dementia about what's going on. In fact, um, there are some organizations we work with that have uh, said that they are respecting the wishes of the family caregivers not to share this because it would just simply be too upsetting. I think it's hard to be in a bubble and like not know what's happening, but again, people forget. So is it necessary to bring it up to them? It's a little bit of an ethical question, a little bit of a moral question. We we do sometimes have therapeutic fibbing and there's a time and a place. So it's it's worth exploring that. It's a little bit values-based, but it's also sometimes important to talk about how these times are different. Say there's a state of Israel. Um, today, we have the ability to please God defend ourselves. Okay, so now we're moving on to the journey of the person living with dementia. So special considerations, right? You've got a person living with dementia. We know that over time, their verbal abilities diminish, right? So more and more, it's going to become important for us to become attuned with what's going on with them, like in terms of looking at patterns in time and also looking at how they're doing in different situations and knowing that they too are going to become more attuned with our body language and our facial expression, other things that we do to convey messaging. So maybe messaging is like, they always say like 80% of messaging is not just what you say, but how you say it, right? So 
if you're saying something with a frown or you're raising your voice in sort of an upset way where you're kind of speaking over them and you're standing over them and it sounds loud, that might convey a lot of discontent. And, you know, you might be more upset with the situation than with something that's specifically going on with them. And you can even say, you know, name it, you know, I'm, I'm having a rough day or things going on in my life outside of caring for you that just are making it hard for me. So just acknowledging that can be really powerful. Uh, we talked before about sort of how people can have associations connected to the different senses, right? And so the same way the caregiver can have this experience, well, so certainly can the person living with dementia, right? So if the person living with dementia has this trauma history, we know that there are going to be certain things that are going to serve as triggers. And when that happens, it's just, you know, kind of anticipating and being mindful that these are some of the hot buttons, whether it's sounds of sirens or someone asking you to bathe in a shower when you, you know, might associate the shower with that gas chamber, like figuring out what are the the points that are going to be disconcerting and like getting creative about, are there other ways to do this, right? Does it have to be a shower? Could it be a sponge bath? Um, could we do it um, wearing some clothing, not totally without clothing? Could we do it with your favorite smelling uh, shampoo and conditioner and bubbles? You know, how do we do this so that it's more positive? Could we change the lighting? Could we do an activity before or after the ritual that we create that makes it more safe? Like, how do we create an environment that that makes the person living with dementia feel safe? And of course, we can limit the, the media exposure. We also want to be mindful that the same way we've met one person with dementia and they're just one person, we know that um, people also deal quite differently with trauma. And no two people deal with trauma or experience or dementia in the same way. So there's not like a tried and true way, but there there are some things that we should be mindful of and kind of giving people space to have different feelings and different ways of responding is important. Uh, we want to provide reassurance as much as possible. I think sometimes people just need to know that they're safe. I think you will often hear people ask that they want to go home. I want to go home. I want to go home. And what do you do when they're already at home? Like, what is that really about? And so we could try to argue with them and tell them, you're at home which we know is a recipe for, who knows, lots of conflict, um, or we could step into the conversation and get curious, right? What is it about being at home that's important to you? What, what, describe that for me. What, what, what do you see in your home? What pictures are you looking at? What's your favorite room? And you, you know, maybe they're thinking about the childhood home and you can take out a photo album and look at it together. Maybe you can have a conversation about what would make where they're living now feel more like home. Do they want some photographs surrounding them uh, of their family members? Um, or do they want something that they, they painted that's beautiful to be up on the walls? Like, how do you make it feel more like home? How do we increase the sense of safety? Okay. Um, helping the person engage in something meaningful um, that will help them cope, right? Sometimes I think people with dementia, and it might be, again, related very much to stigma. I know we were having a conversation earlier that sort of suggested this, might spend a lot of time with an aide sitting beside them, kind of at home, perhaps engaging with a television set, um, perhaps, you know, trying to read something, but there's not necessarily all that much comprehension going on. And maybe their days are just kind of going by in a way that doesn't feel terribly meaningful. So if we could make a conscious effort to get them involved in things that are appropriate for however they are functioning, right? Because they still have a lot of strengths. If we could figure out what their strengths are and how to engage them in a way that's meaningful, we could really change the trajectory of how they're doing, right? So maybe it's doing a small puzzle. Maybe it's doing a word find. Maybe it's, you know, doing some artwork. Maybe it's reading something out loud together and then discussing it to the best of your ability, even if one is more the person giving over the information, the other is more receiving. Like, what could we do together to have a shared experience or an independent experience that just increases the quality of someone's time? And again, we throw back to media because it's big. Just make sure like to turn it off when necessary. You might think that you're watching and no one no one else can see. We tend to have devices in every room now and in every place and um, you're out in the world at large. It's everywhere, even if you don't have the devices at home. And just being mindful that, you know, if people still have vision and they still have hearing, uh, they can also take in what's going on, even if that's not your intention and you think you're just looking at it yourself or that the person next to you on the, you know, the bus is just looking at themselves. Uh, and then we want to talk about when is it appropriate to just provide some comfort. You know how we all have maybe our moments where we just need that comfort food where, you know, we know it's like not really the thing we're supposed to be eating, but like we, we treat ourselves. You know, what are the things that we can do that make something feel more comfortable? I often like to think about how older adults can often be deprived of like the feeling of connection through touch. 
and maybe you find like a lotion that's like a favorite scent of theirs or and you like rub like like a hand rub if they're comfortable with that and you know it's a way of connection because you're you're touching and you're you're um, soothing and you might be speaking in a soft voice like I think really how we conduct ourselves and the activities we choose have a really big role to play in our ability to distract or redirect or to calm someone um, so just briefly, there are a few scenarios that I thought I would just point out that I think are probably the most common, right? For those of you who are caring for someone living with dementia, whether you're a professional or you're a family member, I'm guessing that at some point you have touched upon some of these things. We mentioned the last one, expressing the desire to go home, right? We talked a little bit about that. But I think sometimes it's the insistence that you've not been attentive. Like you just got off the phone. You just saw the person because you don't live with them. Um, the kids just came over, whatever it is. And they're like, I feel like you're not paying attention to me. We haven't spoken in months and and I feel I feel like you don't care anymore. And you know the temptation is there. It's to be like I just spoke to you. I just saw you. We just spent time together. But you know maybe it's you know in their experience it feels like such a long time ago, right? The concept of time is so abstract. And it's so hard to remember that that was, you know, before the nap, but it's the same day or that was the day before, or the, you know, the sense of time just changes. Um, so, you know, it can be like, I'm so glad we're able to to connect now for a few minutes. I know I wish I also could spend more time. I so value it as well. You're know, just letting them know that they're still needed, that they're still loved, that they're still recognized as people. And that's choice that we want to spend time with them is really important. And also understanding, like, if you were there more, like, what would they want to do with you? Maybe that gives you some clues of like how you might spend your time together going forward. Talked a little bit about wandering. So I just want to revisit that. So wandering is like the technical term that we've given in the field to people who go out and leave their environment with the intention of going someplace else and kind of get distracted, can't remember where they were going, why they were going, or how to get back. And it can be pretty uneventful and the person can kind of gently be redirected or it can be really scary and scary not just for the person living with dementia, but also for the people who are the caregivers, right? Imagine you have a loved one and you want to know that they're safe, right? The same way we want to know that the hostages are safe. We want to know that our children, that we just, we want to know the people in our life we care about who might require some more attention and care or being cared for in the way that they deserve to be. And so we really want to make sure that we're showing up for them um, before this happens, right? You know, if someone's wandered, you've done the best you can. And, and so now there are some steps you can take. But the ideal is the same way we sort of have insurance, if you will, in a whole host of things in our life. If you own a car or you have a home or your rent, you know, there's just so many ways that we try to insure things that wander safety programs are designed to be an insurance. It's like a peace of mind. You hope never to have to use it, you know, you, but you, but by having it, it, it goes a long way. And the idea behind that is we have a program that's a partnership with Medic Alert and allows you to enter your information, particularly if you're in the New York state area, but there are other systems in other places too. Uh, but in the New York area, at least, you enter your information into a national directory, uh, both of the care partner and the person living with dementia. And then they put on a bracelet. And the bracelet is not like this gem of jewelry, but it just does the trick, right? It's so basic. They never, the person has it sized, put on, never takes it off. And then if they ever go out in the community, we believe that first responders, whether they're firefighters, police officers, um, ambulance workers, Hatsala, for instance, that they know what's going on and how to redirect people. And of course, having more eyes and ears out in the community would go a long way which goes back to the comfort in dealing with the stigma, right? So if we were to say, this is not all on us and we're going to open it up to other people in our community, maybe we live in a cul-de-sac or we live in a, 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 a an apartment building where we were able to say here, you know, these are people that I'd like you to know, um, doormen, friends, neighbors. I'd like you to keep an extra set of eyes on this such and such person if you can. This person, you know, you know, if you notice them walking out in in shorts and a tank top or a short skirt and a and and you know no coat no hat and, and they're heading out in the middle of winter, that's probably means that they're not meant to be walking out. If you could just check in with them and kind of uh, redirect them, it's just sort of being proactive, and that requires us getting comfortable ourselves with the fact that our people have multiple health conditions. Like comorbidities happen over time. People get sicker, but it's the blessing to be alive and. We actually can decrease our responsibility while still being accountable by embracing other people's participation in, in the joint journey. So a little plug for, you know, being proactive there. Sundowning is the phenomenon usually occurring towards the end of the day when the sun is literally going down, it's setting, and people 
with dementia often, but not always become more agitated, more disoriented, less kind of grounded in where they are. Um, so it tends to be a particularly difficult time and having like a nice routine to engage somebody in and being able to let them know that wherever they want to be, that they are someplace safe and it's going to be okay. And, you know, there's, there are people around them who are there, uh, makes a big difference. I really would choose what kind of conversations and activities you do around that time of day, because it tends to be harder. So for instance, like caring kind, we try really hard not to have our early stage programming during that hour of the time, a day, because it's just not conducive. Uh, so for those of you who observe Sabbath, for instance, as the sun is going down, you might actually notice that your person is having a harder time. So while we traditionally think of Sabbath observance and all the holidays that end, that start rather with the sun going down and that end an hour after the sun going down, we usually think of that as being like we mark a milestone at the beginning of a holiday, a hug, and the end of it. We have to be mindful that that might be a particularly difficult time for our folks and be able to offer them some extra supports. Maybe it's a little overwhelming if we're all together. We have like a breakout space. Um, you know, if we need some one-on-one -on -one time, but just something to think about. Shadowing is another interesting phenomenon that that comes up and it's kind of described like, I feel like this person is under my feet all the time. I feel tethered to them or that they're tethered to me. And I think that, the, again, this is sort of um, a desire for the person with dementia to feel safe and to feel secure and feel connected. And so during times like this, it might be hard to feel like you have your space to breathe and you might have to get a little creative about how you create those spaces. Um, and you might need to proactively look for some respite in different forms uh, and try to build up a trusted relationship between the person living with dementia and someone else. We talked about refusing to bathe. Refusing to bathe is actually quite common, not just for Holocaust survivors, but across the board. And the reason why that is so common, among other things, is that usually there's an unmet need. Uh, we talked about like maybe the temperature is too cold or maybe the temperature is too hot. Maybe the light is too bright or maybe it's not bright enough or maybe the room feels too cold. There's a draft in the air. It really is a matter of experimenting. And I like to offer everyone the opportunity to sort of put on their detective hats. I don't know if anyone had a, you know, a thought once in life that they want to kind of be a detective, but this is a great time because you want to be looking for patterns and seeing like where things are happening so that you can try introducing new ways of doing things that might be effective. Uh, refusing to get a haircut might be on there too. I don't know, sharp objects, um, having a haircut, I think specifically for Holocaust survivors might be a little bit harder because it might be a reminder of, you know, having um, hair removed in the camps. Needless to say, there are so many examples I could bring up, but I want to come up for air. It's been a lot of talking. I want to pause and I want to check in with all of you and engage and see what's important to you all um, to talk about. I'm going to stop sharing for a second and see if I can just look at all of you and get a sense of what's on your minds. Uh, and before I do that, I just want to acknowledge that I don't know everybody by any means, but I see some familiar faces and names. So we've got Mary Hume, who is uh, one of our amazing support group leaders. Uh, I see Miriam Ravner, and I think I just saw a few other Toby Weiss, who are partners in the world of providing support that's culturally sensitive in the Jewish world. Um, let's see. I don't know. I see, I see a whole bunch of names, uh, but I just really want to open this up to everyone and see what we can do to address those things that are on your minds. So would anyone be brave enough um, to share, comment, ask? Hey, sure. Hi, um, my name is Debbie Hoffer. I'm from Catholic Charities Neighborhood Services. Um, I have a question. So let's say now you have a client that has dementia and was a Holocaust survivor. And in their memory, they're going back to the worst time in their life, actually being in the concentration camp. Uh, how would you redirect them or what would be the best way to redirect them to, where they felt safe? Sure, did anyone hear the question? So it's looking at a moment when someone is maybe remembering some of the more difficult times, some of the more traumatic times and how we, would we redirect them? So I think there are a couple of things that can be done and I'll, I'll talk about a few of them, but then I'm wondering if other people want to, to weigh in and share some ideas. Uh, so needless to say, anytime, regardless of the reason that someone feels uh, like they're going back to a place that's particularly hard, we want to try and ground them in a sense that they are safe and we want to redirect them with something else that they can focus on that could be meaningful. 
Um, so for instance, if someone is remembering a time that was particularly different, difficult as it relates to a traumatic experience, we could say that sounds, you don't want to just gla you know, glance over it and not acknowledge. I think it's really important to validate. Um, so you'd want to spend some time trying to talk to them about how important it is that you understand that this seems incredibly difficult and it is so incredibly painful that they had to deal with that. And if you if you could do anything, you wish you could take away that experience from them, but you know that it's real. But right now, thank goodness, the moment looks different. So we want to figure out what we can do to ground ourselves to where we are. So one exercise that's particularly nice is to look into pausing and saying, let's just for a moment sit here and name three things that you can hear and two things that you can see. And maybe one thing that you can touch. And you kind of just encourage them to become keenly aware of their environment where they are right now. I think that's one important piece, like kind of grounding in the present. And then the other thing I think that's super important is to then gently redirect them to something else that feels very um, meaningful. Like, so it's not just, oh, I'm going to ignore you. Okay, but you know, I think that you might enjoy spending some time over here now, or did you notice there's a brand new set of flowers over here, or there's, you know, whatever it is, and saying, let's focus on something that's going to, to uplift our, our spirits. Let's focus on something that we can take in that's going to bring some joy. Maybe we could, you know, do an art project together. I don't know how much time you would have in that moment and in what setting that's happening, but I think it's certainly important um, to validate, to acknowledge, and then to bridge to the fact that they're safe now and to look at something positive in the environment. What are some of the others of you think? Let's say, Hobie says, help to focus on the moment. Good. Uh, remind them when they are, uh, where they are, ensure them that they're safe, right? I'm here with you. I know that 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 memory feels scary, but we're we're here now and you're safe. And it may not feel that way, but we're going to, we're going to, we're going to do something together now that maybe you enjoy. Anyone else have other ideas? Thanks for your ideas, Toby. Anybody else have a, and you see Angela, I'm not sure if you have a different question or even another idea. Anybody? Um, yeah, I, just to, to close out with that, I, that point, I think that there's no one right answer. And I think that there's going to be a lot of trial and error. So for one person, it might be, why don't we go for a walk up and down the hall? I think, you know, getting out of your system. Like let's pace, let's let's put our energy into a more constructive way or let's harness our energy to go sing a song together. What song, you know, really, you know, shares how you're feeling? You know, I know this song, you know, and just going into a joint activity where the focus is put someplace else where you know it's going to be healthier. Okay. Um, Adina, you can also ask them what they can do to be safe. What helps them feel safe, right? We can ask them directly for some people who are earlier on the experience. I'm kind of thinking of someone a little bit more advanced. Someone earlier on the experience might be articulate and can say, you know, I would really feel more safe if, you know, could we go sit over here? Um, could we go get a drink of water? Could I go splash some water on my face? Could we, you know, take a walk in some fresh air? Whatever is available to you, right? That is. Angela, I see that you have your hand up. Did you want to add something or a comment? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Hi, um, I'm wondering about uh, when you have people that um, become agitated and then they start to talk in a in their native language that is not English and what you can do to kind of like redirect them or try to understand what they're trying to say or yeah, in that situation. Yeah, I think that's actually more common than not, right? Because we say that when people have dementia, their, their earlier memories are the ones that they hold on to. It's the short-term memory that tends to fade first. And so if we think about that, that's also why it's particularly hard, I think, for Holocaust survivors who might be going to a place of remembering some of the more difficult times. And similarly, people who have learned multiple languages, they often revert back to that like mother tongue, the thing that they first uh, were able to, to speak. It's kind of like going back to what feels most natural. Uh, and I think, you know, for this one, I hope that there's someone on staff on hand that can speak another language that would be really wonderful who can, you know, fill in, you know, hear that familiar sound and can, and can help. But, it, you know, I think that there are other ways to kind of redirect, you know, when somebody's going back to their original language, I, I wonder if maybe sometimes singing songs without words can help, right? Because, um, 
I feel there's a concept in Judaism of singing a nigun or a nigan, right? And and we know that the power of song is very powerful and it doesn't have to be the words. So maybe it's like a hum or like a, a gentle thing, but something that you can have a shared experience. Like that person is clearly trying to convey something. The other piece that comes to mind is really trying to get them um, to be centered again and 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 mindful of where they are in the moment, right? Because if they're thinking that they're someplace else, if we could ground them and, and do maybe a similar exercise or maybe something different that gets them to realize that here and now, the people around them speak a different language and they're in a different place, maybe then they will naturally kind of go back to, you know, some of the other things. Curious, what are some of the others of you think? I see Annie wrote something about the dog wants to go for a walk, shall we take him, right? So that's a, another way to, to to offset and to redirect. Is there anyone who has an idea about the language piece? I think we should all be blessed with lots of language interpreters in our in our space. What do you guys think? What would you do if the person you're caring for has gone back into that language and you don't know it? I think if we do know it, we go with it, right? We, we just step into that and we, we carry on and have that conversation. Um, if we don't, I think it's a little bit trickier. Right? What, what else comes to mind? I would be so curious about what the person's thinking about. Like, oh, wow. That's, so, that, you know, you must be saying something so mean. I wish I could understand what you're saying. You know, I wish, I want to know. I can see, I might comment on their expression. Like, are they sharing something that's positive just by looking at their face? Are they smiling? Is it making them sad? Are they starting to cry? You'd say, I noticed, you know, that um, you have this big smile on your face. I want to know more. And maybe they will just naturally respond in the language you speak. Or I'm observing that you 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 really seem to be like, you know, closing in. Like you seem worried and concerned. It sounds like you're describing a really tough time. Sometimes people have the ability to go back and forth between two languages. You know, if you're, you're blessed to be able to speak more than one language, like people slip in and out. Like they can say things in one language, but understand in another and, and keep going back and forth. So it's worth trying that too. Um. And I hear this, that's a beautiful language. Are you speaking French? I love to hear you speaking French, right? So just acknowledging with Annie again. I like that, right? Listening to somebody speak a different language, um, naming what you think that language might be and saying, oh, it, it sounds so beautiful. Again, you're speaking the language you know, um, but then it gives them the space to know that they're being heard, I guess, even in a different language, even if you don't fully understand. Other things that you guys might do with language changing? Uh, Miriam, like, uh, I know that you work in a hospice, uh, space. I mean, you must be dealing with people who are her further along, primarily nonverbal. What are some of the kinds of things that you might see if you want to share anything that's come up that you want to highlight or that you found that's worked or that's particularly challenging you want to talk about? Nothing? No, I, I, I didn't know how to unmute. I have to speak many, many languages. So for me, it's not such a challenge. But I, I think what you said earlier about the safety, even humming a melody or saying, I can't really understand fully, but um, maybe we can hum a melody together or a gentle touch or just a dis, this feeling of, of, of stroking someone's hair. Um, we had uh, cases where people want, kept saying mommy, mommy, mommy a hundred times in a row. Mm -hmm. And the most moving image was a Jamaican nurse coming in and lying down next to the patient and caressing her and saying, mama is here because she understood instinctively, mm -hmm. even though that was Yiddish, it's similar. But she knew what this person needed at 90 something years old, that everybody will respond to somebody approaching gently, not uh, not threateningly or that they think they are being violated. But she leaned in and then she laid down next to her and she quivered and she kept saying, Mama is here. Mama is here. And it worked. Person started to relax and then closed her eyes. And so those are the moving moments. I think you have to really listen to your instinct of, of how am I going to go here and, and show my humanity. And they're going to pick up on that to give them the sense of, 
of safety and, and being heard, whether their words make sense or not. And I meant to add something else. When people say they want to go home, even in their dementia, many people are aware of how much they have lost personality, selfhood, um, dignity. It could also mean they want to die. It's they're ready to mm -hmm. take leave and to go home to the eternal home that they've had enough of this existence because they have glimmers and they, they see that they are a shelf of who they were before. And so with that sense of loss comes a wish um, to let go of life and to, to find eternal peace, so to speak. So I just wanted to point that out. It's not just always around their apartment and telling them you are home, ain't gonna make it. Um, <laughs> Both, both thoughts were so, so beautiful. Thank you for sharing those. Yeah, I, I want to just say a little bit more about that. Thank you for highlighting those things so, so beautifully. I think that this idea that we take things very literally uh, is not always is right. It's not always right, right? So sometimes it's more about, like I said, getting curious and figuring out what's behind that. And again, as people are going to progress to the stages, they are going to become less and less verbal. And so the same way we have to be self-aware, we have to also like train ourselves to focus more on not necessarily what they're saying, but how they're saying, what they're saying, uh, reading between the lines. And so, you know, especially in a hospice or a palliative kind of world, there's so much more focus and correct me if I'm wrong, right? There's so much more focus on using uh, the five senses and, and looking beyond just the verbal communication. And so the verbal communication certainly is something in terms of what they say, but I'm much more interested, I guess, in the demeanor, you know, like what is going on? Uh, do they seem agitated? You know, is it, is it that time of day that we know is particularly difficult for them? Uh, you know, do they, you know, just have a terribly cold shower and they came out and, and the air is very cold and they don't feel comfortable. They just want to like be snuggled and what's going on. And I think using our, our power of observation is important. But Miriam also reminded me of such a beautiful clip that I've watched many times and shared during the family caregiver workshops we've done uh, of a Naomi file who uh, was such a gifted uh, clinician in the world of validation therapy. And she has these beautiful, beautiful moments where she engages with somebody who is practically nonverbal, but is still able to hold her body upright in like a, I imagine it's a wheelchair. And the, the person is barely able to say anything. And Naomi Fable leans in, just like Miriam uh, was describing her, leans in and holds her hand, gets real close because you have to remember people's vision changes, right? When they have dementia, right? The vision, there are these great images, like what do you see like this? What do you see with one eye? What do you see, you know, only this distance. You have to keep reminding yourself this field of vision is getting smaller. So leaning in really close and then being at the same level, not arching over and standing over somebody in a way that feels overpowering. All those like small things make a really big difference to create that, that rapport. And then holding someone's hand over so gently, and just having this conversation, I, I mean, it looks like they're face to face. Like we talk about like what's a safe uh, distance to be in the six feet apart for COVID. This was not the six feet apart for COVID. This is pre-COVID. <laughs> and this is like a really close interaction and gently rubbing just like you know, the, the cheeks. And uh, all of a sudden they start humming like a, I think it was like a church hymn together. And within moments, you know, the woman starts tapping and she's going to the beat and, and she is expressing connection. And then the words who would think this person has basically been nonverbal? Out come the words to the song, to this to this hymn that she she has grown up with and been in the church for for however many you know gazillions of sessions for, and she is in it in that moment, and then she sheds a tear, and what happens? Naomi acknowledges the tear and like even wipes the tear, away. and they they have this moment of deep connection, and I think what that highlights for me is one of the initial things we said, which is sort of changing our expectations as care partners and caregivers for what a meaningful interaction looks like and how we can have connection. Because there are the tasks of caregiving, right? There are the activities of daily living, the toileting and the bathing and the and some of the stuff is not so glamorous and it's not really the way we want to connect with someone, whether it's in a residential setting or at home. But even within those moments and certainly between, there are ways to take um, precious time to kind of connect with somebody. And so I think the challenge we have is really more for ourselves as caregivers to look at how do we get creative to do that? 
you know, and I, it's not always easy and I think it requires time. And so that's why I think the time element is such a, a big factor. If we're on the run, we're rushing, we're rushing. We're not going to be as gentle as we want to be. And we're not going to be as patient as we want to be. Right. Ah, Miriam. Yeah. I just wanted to add something that rituals, which people have observed in their past, whether they were visiting their grandparents or where, whether they did them themselves are very helpful um, in, in recreating a pleasant past experience. And so I have very often celebrated uh, the Sabbath with lighting candles with a uh, demented person, even though it was Tuesday. It didn't make a difference. That's what gave them joy or took them back to when their family was intact pre-war or, or even after war, when they came and rebuilt lives and, uh, and hum some of the melodies of the Friday night liturgy, for example. And, uh, and people just either sing along or hem along, or you could just see the agitation diminishes and they find peace. And uh, so what? What, what if it's not on the exact time of the week? It's something that helps them or a man wrapping himself in the prayer shawl, even if he can't say the words of the prayers anymore, the feeling, the texture of the prayer, the fringes that hang from it, that can be very, very soothing as well. So beautiful. I want to highlight something that Toby is sharing because I know some of you are more like texting and some of you are more commenting. Um, but Toby, you know, who, who works closely with Miriam is also uh, talking about how uh, singing a Yiddish song to a Holocaust survivor can, who was also living with dementia can bring them back to fond memories, the positive memories returning to the here and now. So a lot of examples of, of using nonverbals or or music and the power of touch and things like that nature. Uh, I noticed that Mary's here and I'm, I'm wondering, you you have so much experience yourself. Are there some things that you want to highlight about, you know, working with individuals who are, are living with dementia and what you have found helps them to either redirect or become calm or more centered, anything that comes to mind? I like many of the the comments that have, have been made um, just in, in terms of being with the person where they're at. Uh, I, I can remember that I'm, I'm, Shira knows this and, and some of the other people on this call do too. I'm a former caregiver having cared for my mom for a number of years and being primary caregiver and I I can remember although she wasn't a holocaust survivor um, she was certainly far along into the dementia and was also on a hospice program for a little over a year uh, before she died and I have such wonderful things to say about hospice you can imagine just just incredible and uh, you know, I, I can remember times when she was so actively delusional. And here I am, uh, a professional social worker, but this was my mother. <laughs> and it was very difficult, you know, when she thought things like that she, uh, at 100, was having a miscarriage and needed to go to the hospital. And mm -hmm. she truly believed that that was what was happening to her. And I, I of course... You know, what I wanted to say, and I didn't say it, was that's not happening to you, but because this was her reality. So just asking how she was doing, how she how she was feeling and just assuring her that she was OK. And she did calm down. And then we kind of worked through it and, and figured out that she was thinking about one of my sisters who, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm talking about like probably like 30 years ago had a miscarriage that, so she was mixing up all sorts of things that it mm -hmm. happened to someone else. But, and, and I, I said to her, I said, even though it did, it, it still was, and even though it was a while ago, it's very, very sad. It's even though it wasn't you and, and it happened in the past. And when she was able to connect to that, it took a lot of, of working through, but it, it was very, very sad and it's okay to be sad about it. Um, Mary, it's such a beautiful example. Thank you for sharing that. I, I think that this is another one of those examples where the temptation to bring someone into our reality, the reality we know to be tried and true, 
is always there. And it's usually the thing that has the um, least effective response, right? It usually creates agitation, frustration, creates an argument. It's everything you, you you probably are tempted to do was like, you have to be very counterintuitive and say, okay, I'm going to step into their world. I'm going to join them where they are. And we're going to talk about this. Like, so what are you feeling? What do you, you know, you know, what can I do to make you more comfortable? You're just like in it with them. Uh, and, and the more we can be in it with them and sort of speak to the underlying emotion that they are sharing, the more we can keep them feeling safe, which, you know, brings down the temperature and gets us to a place where we're doing better. I think we have time for like maybe one more comment or question. And I just want to give someone else perhaps who hasn't a chance to ask or speak to, to raise something. Anybody? I'm, I, I spoke say before. I, I just want to say the dignity of the person needs to be maintained, whether they are demented, whether they are de delusional, or whether they have moments of competence and are present. Their dignity is sacrosanct. And I think that's what we always have to remember. And I guess the challenge that that poses, right, is that sometimes we can be almost like so focused on dignity that we don't include enough people in the support system, right? So we want to make sure that we're respecting their values and respecting their privacy, but not to the detriment of their own care, right? Like if we could be telling a Bihar Holim committee, a committee of people who want to visit the sick, and we could be telling the clergy members who could be saying uh, Misha Bera that they should get healthy and well, and and if we could be having people, you know, from the larger community, neighbors, you know, help out in some way, then we have to balance, you know, the, the dignity piece, which obviously is of the utmost importance with this idea that we have to do it all alone. And if we burn ourselves out, which is kind of like my takeaway message, and we try to do it all on our own, we are not helping our person. And so looking to figure out what's really a safety risk to themselves and others is different from, well, my person used to like this very fancy outfit and be dressed with fine jewels and have, you know, a certain amount of makeup on and is now, you know, lying in a very casual outfit that they wouldn't previously have been willing to show up in. But if that's what works for them and that's how they feel comfortable and they can have a meaningful social engagement, I say, let's work on ourselves and the comfort that we have expand that because we're actually doing, I think, while still being um, sensitive to the person's thing, I think we're actually doing more for them and for ourselves as caregivers if we can widen the group of people. And if everyone on the call were to just pick one more person that you included, we would actually be reducing the stigma and creating a broader support system for ourselves and everyone else. So I, I leave everybody um, hopefully a little encouraged to, to, to push a little bit, try to include one more person in the caregiver journey, um, try to find one thing that you know works for you when you're feeling dysregulated. We've all been there uh, and we will all be there again. And that there are, there's no magic, um, you know, thing that works. I think it's becoming like come, developing your own toolkit. And if any of you are interested in reaching out to Karen Kinds or any of these other wonderful professionals um, and want to, you know, be involved more, we really encourage you to reach out because no one should have to do this alone. And we're really here to be the trusted partner. Uh, whether it's a support group or an educational webinar or referrals or just coaching, like you name it. So please don't do it all on your own. <laughs> it's too isolating. <laughs> okay. Thank you everyone for your time, your patience, and um, thank you for contributing. And I, I'm sorry about the technical glitches in the beginning, but I'm so glad that we could be together. And I look forward to connecting with you all in future times. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Shira. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.